Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual forum by the Global Investigative Journals Network. My name is Silvia Vinas, and I'm an executive producer of uh, Elilo, a weekly narrative news podcast from uh, Vice News. We are in this forum because journalists are the bullseye of the whole world with unprecedented levels of harassment, surveillance, legal threats, and physical abuse. Impunity is close to 90%, and most murders of journalists go unresolved. But the media and their allies are determined to resist. In this virtual forum of the Global Investigative Journalist Network, we bring together reporters on the front lines who have experienced these attacks firsthand, and we'll ask them how they work and what do they do to guarantee their safety and protection. Journalists from around the world can learn from them. They have fought back in legal battles. They have been tracked with intrusive spyware, and they have received death threats for their work. Before we begin, you may have noticed by now that we are offering this webinar in English. And if you wish to listen to it in that language, you must select it here on Zoom. I hope our instructions are clear, but just to repeat, to listen to the virtual forum in English, you have to select the globe icon at the bottom of the screen. On the right side, select English and then select mute original audio. All right. I would like to introduce today's guests. Marcela Turati is an investigative journalist who covers the victims of the drug war in Mexico. She's a co-founder of the investigative journalism lab Quinto Elemental Lab, and she coordinates the website Adonde Van Los Desaparecidos, an investigation analysis of disappearance in Mexico, and the project hashtag Mas de 72 on massacres and disappearances of migrants. Marcelo also co founded Periodistas de Pie, an organization dedicated to promoting training, protection, and safety networks for journalists. Hello, Marcela. Hello, good morning. Pleasure to have you here. We also have from Peru, Christopher Acosta, who is an investigative journalist. His reports, which have revealed corruption schemes, financial fraud, and organized crime, have been published by Poder Magazine, the newspapers La República and El Comercio, and by Latina Televisión, where he currently directs the investigative unit. He is one of the co founders of Colpin, one of the region's most important journalistic institutions in the region. Hello, Christopher. Hello, how are you? Great, we can hear you. And Jose Luis Sanz is director of the digital newspaper El Faro. Within the media, he is a founding member of Sala Negra, an investigative team specializing in organized crime and violence in Central America. His chronicles have been published in several books. The most recent is an anthology called Terror Zones. Hello, Jose Luis. Hello, Sylvia. Just to be clear, I'm not the director anymore. Uh, right now I'm based in Washington. I'm a reporter in Washington. Right. Well, uh, greetings to you as well. Before starting, I will let you speak soon, I promise. A little bit of information about uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Network for those of you who don't know it. This is the world's largest network of non-profit investigative journalism with 227 member organizations in 88 countries. It works with journalists everywhere from NGOs to freelancers to commercial organizations. It has a wide range of guides and resources to help journalists around the world, which they can, they can consult at gijn.org. And we will be sharing some of them during this forum. Finally, at the end of the forum, we will be taking questions from the audience. So please send your messages via chat. And uh, during the last part of the session, we will pass them to the speakers. Finally, please note that we will be recording this session for later posting it on YouTube. All right, so let's get started. I would like to ask each and every one of you to sum up their, your cases briefly. Perhaps we can start with you, Marcella. Of course. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone, all my colleagues, everyone who is watching us. My case, I could say, is not that recent, although I found out about it only this year. 
and that is when the Pegasus project came out, they revealed the cell numbers that could have been potential targets or that could be potential targets of the Pegasus malware. So my phone number was among them. They let me know a day before this was list, this list was published. So it's kind of difficult to assimilate. And a month later, when an attorney of the massacre cases that I've covered in Nataulipas, close to the border with the United States, massacres that occurred in 2010, 2011, when she accessed the judicial file, uh, she saw one of my reports and from there, uh, it was shown that uh, who that they were spying me, who I had called before, and uh, they made a list of uh, my contacts, uh, my network of where I've been and how I've seen the possible information source of the website where we published more than the more than seventy two massacres, and without getting a, a warrant from the judge, the if from any judge, the prosecutors did this. So the attorney, a forensic anthropologist and me, we were on the same file of the Setas cartel and we are also spied on. And uh, the crime there could be kidnapping and uh, organized crime. This is to have access. That is to not have to say to a judge or explain to a judge that they were spying on a journalist. So, well, this was very shocking. This happened in 2016, and we don't know if it continued, if the file, the file is still open, we're still on it. And well, one of the parts that I can present here today and the other one is as a journalist who has promoted the creation of protection networks for journalists, uh, since we've many times had to act in cases of emergency when a journalist has to leave or they are at risk. Right. Thank you, Marcela. I don't know if you could also tell us a little bit about the general situation of uh, journalists in Mexico right now. This year has been especially impactful. Yes, the situation in Mexico is a disaster. Mexico is the most dangerous country to be a, a journalist. For many years it has been, and it's a country that is not officially at war. So many times we have been uh, above Iraq or Afghanistan in terms of uh, murder journalists. Uh, January 10th to uh, February 10th, we have actually had five journalists who had been murdered in different parts of the country. So from 2000 and up until this date, uh, we have 150 murdered journalists and 25 who have been disappeared, according to Article 19, uh, due to causes possibly linked to their profession. So on top of that, the judicial harassment levels are going up. These, uh, this kind of uh, lawfare is going back up. Uh, we have cases of uh, espionage and uh, journalists being incarcerated. Uh, but we know that Picassus is not the only thing. This is only for a group of for journalists uh, for in which they have they want to invest money into spying. But there are other uh, espionage techniques and threats. They've also gone up, I think, in many countries, especially with the pandemic threats uh, through social networks, through the internet. So the landscape and us, on top of that, a constant harassment from those in power, often enough from the president of the Republic who every third day in his, his conferences on uh, national networks, he attacks journalists. Actually today, he just said that we're all dishonest, that we're all corrupt everything that he always says that we're always that we're criminals that uh, uh, and his followers who are often who are part of these campaigns 
and it's uh, very impactful. And this is because of the investigations that he doesn't like. And uh, this is why he lashes out uh, at all the journalists with uh, some very strong harassment. That is horrible. We just uh, shared a guide of how to track the purchases of technology, of espionage technology of your government. This could be very useful. I've shared the link in the chat. Uh, continuing in this line about espionage, Jose Luis, tell us about the case of El Faro and what happened. This is very recent also. This is very recent, uh, the confirmation that is. In the case of El Faro, we're talking about a publisher. We're talking about a newspaper that's 24 years old. 10 years, a bit more maybe that the safety security has become into a central topic for the newspaper due to threats, due to evidence of being followed, etc. The thing is, it has been escalating and evolving to a point where effectively last November when Apple sent uh, journalists, citizens of different countries, they've sent an alert to them saying that there was a suspicion that their devices had been attacked with a spy software linked sponsored by by government by the state out of the 24 journalists who received this alert in el salvador 14 were from el faro in this moment we were already in the process of verification of our of checking our devices because we already had some alerts we were working on it with three organizations with access now the citizen lab and frontline defenders to analyze our devices. And we have in fact confirmed that uh, from an organization of uh, 36 people, 22 of us had suffered, uh, had been victims of uh, espionage. So two thirds basically. And this happens in a context in which what Marcella describes has turned into the new normal with the obvious evidence of uh, journalists being assassinated. The constant media campaign, uh, uh, presidents attacking you, against, this war against journalism has become the new normal in El Salvador. And in the case El Faro especially, it's added to specific campaigns from uh, state controlled uh, media outlets against uh, media outlets against specific journalists harassment on behalf of the state that we have been uh, victims of for the last two years a series of audits that are obviously ill-intentioned uh, the president has uh, said that we have been uh, re uh, have we, we investigated uh, for money laundering, we are, are starting. We have received the first reports that they want to accuse us of uh, tax evasion, which is an absolute line. The whole state apparatus is starting to go against uh, journalism and specifically against our team in El Faro to stop us from working. And as Marcela said, in the case of spy software to have access to our in data. This is in a context of terror that is not just for the critical voice anymore, but for anybody who can collaborate with transparency. There's a double effect, let's say, of this espionage. It's turned towards journalists, but it also intimidates the entire society to back away from the journalists, to fear the consequences of collaborating with transparency, of, of simply being close or uh, approaching certain journalists. And after this was revealed, did the government say anything? The government, officially the president of the Republic, 
especially a spokesperson uh, uh, the influencer say in the power he with his with his aggressive use of Twitter he personally has not talk, talked about the topic there has not been an official version of the state beyond uh, the denial that they use Pegasus despite that there is proof they initially denied it when we, did, we presented proof they did not give an official version although uh, they've made an effort to insinuate that the espionage in El Salvador comes from other countries. Uh, that's especially insinuating that the United States is spying journalists in El Salvador, even uh, public officials in El Salvador, which is, is obviously absurd. But especially what they try to do often is to transfer the conversation to a different space and continue generating noise around the subject. So they, it's, uh, it's the journalist who is being questioned always and not the state to transfer responsibility, responsibility about what the population knows and what they don't know. Always trans, state always tries to shift blame away from them uh, to try to make it disappear. Thank you. Christopher from Peru. Marcela said a moment ago that in Mexico, they can see more of this type of legal judicial harassment. We've seen that in Peru. This has been the case for years. It's been very present and very strong. Your case is one of the most recent ones. Do you think you can tell us about what happened? Yes, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, it seems like we can't hear you anymore, Christopher. Oh, all right. In this panel, one second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Honestly, in the case of Peru, in my case, I feel fortunate, air quotes included, because in Peru, we haven't reached those levels of violence in terms of uh, government harassment. In Peru, we have a sort of a case of lawfare from uh, some politicians, some uh, uh, factual power who start to use judicial and fiscal and uh, prosecutors against the investigations that we perform in the country. Last year, I published this book, Palata Como Cancha. It's a very proven phrase, money la pop popcorn, like to have money in abundance, money by the bucket. Uh, this was uh, an investigation of uh, a politician who was twice a presidential candidate. And the 17 congressman uh, in the parliament, he is a magnet who, who has a network of private universities and is one of the uh, 10 most richest men in Peru. What uh, this book does is show uh, the life of this man, how he began his fortune, but on top of that, how there is a public pattern of his behavior, which is how he gets his audio is cutting out. but not necessarily the rich. The book tells us for the first time the story of, of how a legal team that works for him manages to close some confidential agreements of people who sue him against uh, due to some, for example, 
he uh, plagiarized a book of a university professor by just changing the cover and publishing it his, his own. He just uh, removed the real author from the cover of the book and he himself, uh, he put himself as an author. Uh, there are other cases of plagiarism of uh, uh, thesis, uh, doctorate thesis of a master's thesis. For example, in the University of Madrid decided to uh, withdraw his doctorate and how due to some judicial processes, he managed to keep his doctorate outside of what uh, the uh, law in Peru demands. And among other examples in Peru, from the first moment, this person, uh, after about three weeks of this book has been published, he uh, made a series of uh, comments of harassment against the publisher. First, he sued us uh, with Indicopi, which is the National Institute of the Defense of Intellectual Property. He said that the line itself, Plata Como Cancha, is uh, his intellectual property. He is appealed, of course. But from that moment, with that lawsuit, he tried to stop the book from being sold and distributed. After that, he sued the publisher, the editor, and myself uh, for defamation, demanding damages, sued us for damages for 100,000 solis, which has been the highest uh, amount for which Random House has been sued for. Of course, nobody who uh, sues you for $25,000, seeks justice, they seek to harass you and to intimidate you. After that, he went uh, to another judicial re resource, which is where he demanded that my property be seized. And we can see if, if we can see the funny side of this, and well, uh, he demanded a uh, prison sentence of two years, which we of course have appealed a suspended season sentence, but uh, Peru has had a, such a rejection of uh, uh, this sentence, uh, not specifically because of my book, but because it uh, goes against an international right, because journalists are uh, protected by certain case law internationally. And I'm going to wrap up with this. The judge says that I, as a journalist, uh, the responsibility of what some sources say is transferred to me. These are testimonies that I signed with my name and last name. There are people who are identi identified, who are oh, people from his close environment, his ex-wife, his uh, ex lover, one of his uh, brothers, people have direct contact with the politician who actually wanted to say something about him. And this information is transcribed into the book, but especially in some cases, they are from the pre journalistic quotes that people said, maybe not necessarily for this book, but for other uh, media publications. So this is a, a journalistic right that People, there are people against whom Cesar Acuna never took any action, but he does take action against the person who actually puts all these stories together and organizes them into a narrative of his life. He is a life as an entrepreneur, uh, all his questionable education, his uh, uh, personal and romantic life that has to do with uh, public affairs. And there's a total rejection towards this in the country because the judge goes against the basic right of the truthful copy of transferring testimony without modifying a single comma. This, uh, in, in this context, the journalist cannot absolutely be held responsible, but in Peru, it has happened. Yes, it is impressive. In Lilo, in, 
we have followed the case of Paul Logas, which is similar to yours. And uh, what I've noticed always is that how they pile up all these lawsuits to make you waste time, to make to keep you so busy that you're, you simply don't have enough time for your investigation while you're managing these lawsuits and all the bureaucracy, all the paperwork, and at the same time continue with your investigation. It is a way of, of doing that, of making you waste a lot of time. It is a great distraction, yes, to have a judicial process against you because uh, you have to organize your documents, uh, you have to talk to an attorney for the person who is suing you. Uh, they don't lose any time and maybe lose some money because uh, being a proven magnet, he can hire one of the most powerful law firms in the country. But the absurdity of this case, even because I quoted the politician himself, Sar Saracunia, this has also been considered defamation on my part. If I open quote and uh, quote what he said in an uh, interview or in public, suddenly I am responsible for what he, he himself said. But on top of that, Cesar Acuna has said publicly that he has not read the book. He has not read it. He has said it many times in interviews. So I think that was enough for any judge who has any sense to not even admit this lawsuit. This uh, damage to his reputation, his, as he says, he transferred it to a group of attorneys. Uh, so without knowing really what the book says about him, like uh, he said many times that he uh, hasn't read the book and he just let his attorneys handle it. To understand how to protect ourselves, it's important to understand the patterns in these attacks against journalists. And you have mentioned some of them, but I would like to make a new round with the three of you to see if there's any additional thing to mention. Marcela, apart from what you mentioned, what strategies are used by the state or by the criminal organizations when they harass uh, or disappear or spy on journalists? There there's not a single pattern. There are multiple patterns and different patterns, and we can identify according to the investigations uh, of uh, some organizations is that the perpetrators, we see that uh, people associate the cartels and the organized crime with the harassment against uh, journalists, but there are uh, public officials harassing journalists, but we also see that there is a mix between several factors. Quite often, criminals are hired by, or, by the organized crime to silence a journalist due to an article that probably was not pleasant for a public official. And two out of 150 journalists uh, living in the city of Mexico were killed. So m most of aggressions go against local press. And these are the journalists that work in precarious conditions of work. And they have less uh, reaction capacity with regards to articulating networks or contacts with international organizations or national organizations that may provide help to them or protect them. So the topics they used to cover are the topics that, that uh, trigger anger uh, in politicians, such as the corruption in politics, the corruption in the police, also the denouncing of crimes. But we see also other patterns associated with mega projects. And uh, the narco-trafficking is an example of this. So, um, when there's a lot of money involved, when there is a political or business project that is important, and sometimes journalists are killed by just invest investigating facts about this, not only corruption, for saying that in that uh, particular place there's uh, an increase in insecurity that may put the investment of money at risk. So sometimes 
we don't know. So there is uh, no a clear understanding of what can be published or not. Murders uh, occur generally in times where journalists are doing their daily job. We have seen several cases in which the journalist is killed uh, while uh, driving his car uh, to take his or her children to the school or when arriving at home, the case of Javier Valdez is emblematic, a uh, journalist that we loved uh, so much. He was going out of the newsroom when he was killed. So there was a follow-up on this journalist and then they were subsequently killed. And there are other cases and in many cases, these journalists uh, received the warnings. There was, uh, for example, uh, messages that were sent to them through social media channels. They were informed that they were threatened. But in Mexico, where you receive so many threats due to several reasons, sometimes you don't know whether a threat is uh, serious or not. And there's, an also, there's another risk that you see when you flip the switch of fear, when you start to see fear as something normal because you have uh, undergone several aggressions because it's part of your job. In many cases, there were warnings. And the other pattern is that the authorities in general tried to say, well, this is not something linked to the profession of being a journalist. The, this killing took place for a different reason. This was a love affair uh, or a problem with a neighbor. So generally, the authorities try to uh, present the alleged responsible people, but they don't really investigate who were the intellectual authors of the crime. So they remain with a superficial solution. This is what I would say. Jose Luis, among the colleagues that were spied on, uh, who were working in El Faro. You don't have to reveal what, what they were investigating, but was there a common factor or, or were they selected randomly? It is never random, but in El Faro, with this uh, large hacking, you get to understand and it's kind of difficult to identify what were the investigations that worried the state more because we uh, we think the state is responsible, but you get to understand the truth behind and that the problem is the journalism itself for them. It's not a particular investigation. It's not a punctual journalist or a punctual case. The problem for them is journalism, someone with the capa capability of uh, investigating. In our case, I was uh, one of the first persons that were, was hacked and spied on. Back then I was a director of the newspaper and these uh, hackers had access to several of my relationships in the newspaper. And to highlight what is not that evident, apart from the journalists in our news uh, room that were hacked, that were the vast majority. And we are still investigating if other people in our newspaper uh, was hacked, our financial manager was hacked, our marketing manager was hacked. This was about finding information to inflict damage on the journalism we do. So this is relevant. And I associate this with the ideas that Marcela explained. So the idea of breaking, it's necessary to break with this idea that the criminal organizations are the only ones to attack journalism. And at this point, I'm highlighting uh, espionage, our experience in terms of uh, threats on risk degrees are more associated to the state. 
to corrupt groups within the states or within state institutions such as the police corps, etc. We have had some cases of threats inflicted uh, by gangs or organized crime groups. Yes, but the large, larger threat has come from the state. And this is a key factor to consider, which reminds us that in reality, the political responsibility and the possibility of exercising uh, political pressure, this is a political problem. We need to understand this. This is not a circumstantial problem. This is a political problem in our countries. And I relate this with another idea that is important to mention, a political problem that is spreading all over because beyond the cases and their circumstances in each one of our countries, what it has become evident is that this is a global trend. There is a normalization effect. The threshold of normalization with regard to the threats against journalism and the criminalization of journalism is growing. The use of the state to chase journalists. This threshold three is moving. We're not talking just about this uh, inversion of democracies that we uh, were seeing 30 years ago. No, this is the normalization and the repetition of patterns with specific cases and always with variations. But there is a common ground that makes this a global trend and we need to understand this in this matter. Uh, and this becomes evident in small countries, such as Central American countries. The impact of uh, what happens in Mexico in the region in terms of the attacks against journalism. The impact of, of the trends of public debate on journalism in the United States and in Mexico makes this evident. We need to understand this, that this is a global problem, a global pattern, that this is a phenomenon that uh, implies alliances to attack journalism and attack journalists and two more ideas. This is also expressed in the fact that connecting this with your first question, not always this attack uh, happens after a publication. Even they, they take place even before. And this is something that has become evident in our country with Najib Bukele with the espionage and the threats we have received in previous governments. So before this was a kind of a democratic or political struggle, but this time things have changed and the state started and the political project of Najib Bukele, the state started to act in a preemptive manner against journalism before even the investigations occur. So clearly, this is very evident. And the second thing I wanted to mention was that the investment, there are large amounts of money invested in the public sector against journalism, the large amount of money used to attack journalists. So there is the need to go out from this idea of reaction. This scenario described by Christopher is so serious. It's even absurd. In reality, we're not talking, and correct me, Christopher, if I'm wrong, not even your, in your case, we're not talking about just a single businessman. There is a strategy and there is an economic investment, a large injection of resources, in your case, is in the private sector, but in our countries, in the public sector, these resources are used to inflict damage against journalism. This is a political problem. We need to understand this. And sometimes journalists think that we, we think we are fighting individual actors, but no, there's a whole apparatus attacking journalists. Yes, precisely. I wanted to ask you about this, Christopher. What calls the attention about the Peruvian case is that the judges are admitting these lawsuits are not dismissing them. And this is so serious. So what is going on? Who are behind these lawsuits? I imagine that many of the things that Jose Luis and Marcela mentioned are linked to what you have just lived. Yes, in the case of Peru, I insist. 
in this panel, I think the, my Peruvian case is uh, the less, uh, the less uh, relevant because here in Peru, the uh, actors are clearly identified, their economic powers are clearly identified, but let's pay attention to other cases here in Peru, Paulo Ga, Anilio Vera, Pedro Salinas, that in different moments have investigated, for example, the an organization uh, linked to the Catholic Church in Peru is a community that has been accused uh, in a book published by Pedro Salinas and Patricio Gas of having committed a number of physical and psychological and sexual abuses against a community of students a couple of decades ago. And after this, two journalists have suffered a large number of uh, lawsuits on different grounds, not all exclusively linked to their journalistic work, but there are also random citizens from remote areas um, introducing lawsuits uh, on money laundering against uh, this author, which has triggered investigation on his personal equity or the case Daniel Jovera, who also published an investigation for Al Jazeera related to the finances of the Sodalite group that has also triggered a lawsuit. So there are actors that represent the economic and political power and are clearly identified in Peru and that act against journalists using the judicial apparatus. But to give a wide vision out of Lima, there are journalists in our provinces that have also faced legal problems and they are targeted by regional authorities such as governors, who were elected and taking advantage uh, of the fact that these cases are out of the big press, they, these authorities file lawsuits against these journalists in cases that are not well known and are not maybe that emblematic, but are making these uh, journalists suffer. Different from what happens in Mexico and in El Salvador, at least this pressure against the investigative journalism in Peru comes from these clearly business and political actors that apart they have they are on the spotlight, but they don't care. They got and twist justice to uh, use these uh, lawsuits to harass the press. And going back to the case of Cesar Acuña's case, in this absurd uh, law, lawsuit against me, I'm, I'm the person who has been targeted. Well, Cesar Vallejo is the owner of a university in which there's a journalism school. This is such a contradiction because he's simply ignoring the concept of a uh, informational freedom. There are students from those universities showing me their support. But so this uh, person, Cesar Acuña, is not a new person in the political scenario. My book is not uh, the outcome of two months of work. I've been studying this person for more than 10 years since he was a major. This book describes his uh, promotion from major to governor and then to congressman. He was even two-time candidate to the presidency of Peru. So basically he wants to punish an attitude that he has uh, described publicly as an, uh, an obsession. He is, he seems everywhere in his political life because I have published so many investigations about this person since the beginning of um, my work as a journalist, I started uh, writing pieces since he was a major. So what we see here is a clear harassment against journalists in my case, in the case of Paola and Pedro Salinas, is the use of justice to uh, intimidate journalists. We have 10 minutes left before going to the questions. And I want to use this last part to think about practical and realistic solutions given what you have described so far. I think it's uh, crucial to consider the work precariousness of journalists throughout our region, 
they are not well paid and journalists are not well trained in terms of digital and physical security. So we need to take these factors into account. So many journalists working as freelancers. Marcela, you have a wide experience uh, creating these solidarity networks. Uh, tell us about the resources you have promoted and used with your colleagues in Mexico and what practical tips could you provide to journalists that feel at risk? Before listening, I wanted to tell you that all these things that we are sharing, we are seeing so many exiled journalists from Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Honduras, and El Salvador, apart from those that were exiled from Cuba and Colombia. So this is a serious problem throughout the region. I've based all my work in the creation of networks and teamwork so to with the idea of preventing risk and always focusing on care security the safety of journalists the safety of uh, sources and make sure we are protecting information so you are obliged to develop several methodologies and one of them is not to work on your own so we have been uh, receiving several trainings since 2008 in Mexico. There has been a remarkable investment in uh, developing trainings in the topic of sec safety and uh, digital security. Uh, we were taught that we were, when we were going to attend a journalistic meeting, it was necessary to leave our phone uh, outside in a box or put it in the microwave or in the uh, washing machines and we were called paranoid because uh, we had the idea that we were being spied on we need to assume that everything we're saying is being listened to this is something usual for us so we started to see uh, many things we are always uh, updated in terms of technology it was necessary for us to use a signal, a safe email account. Sometimes it's difficult when you work uh, in a team, it's complicated to share the information. What would you uh, upload to the cloud? I wanted to tell a story. Uh, several years ago, we conducted an investigation and the first thing we did was to agree on how we were supposed to communicate and what we could uh, say to each other. It was necessary to have a keyword that needs to be short that we can uh, write in the group of the platform we're using, Signal, for example, to uh, trigger this warning of risk. It's necessary to have a protocol to follow. If a person writes this word in the chat, it's necessary to activate the safety protocol. It's necessary to call uh, people. So we need to agree on this uh, previously. We have been uh, working for uh, many years and we have colleagues who are monitoring. Most of us are freelancers in a, a newsroom. It's uh, complex to do this. If you take some measures, sometimes your editor ignores uh, this uh, safety reason. So sometimes you need to tell the editor to download Signal. And so it's important to involve editors in these training sessions for everybody to be on the same page and to have always your passport at hand if you have to go out of the country, have cash uh, at hand, have people in the places you're going so that you can ask questions safely. So this work of creating networks and ask other people to do, for example, the requests for information before public institutions so that your name doesn't appear. So and another thing is it's necessary to be careful about what you post on the social media these are basic principles but sometimes uh, there are journalists that uh, make a selfie entering the danger zone and upload it in facebook so this issue about uh, social media uh, it's necessary to raise our voices when our colleagues are uh, in trouble so we need to be activists of the freedom of speech 
because uh, we need to defend information and be advocates uh, for the right of people to be informed, to work in group and ask international organizations. And we have asked the organization to ask for interviews. Sometimes we need to erase our names from investigation for safety reasons. So the horrible thing is that we need to do that a lot of times, eliminate our names from the investigations we made and reduce the risk giving different pieces of information to journalists from other countries to publish uh, for us and to create networks, not only with journalists, but also with advocates and defenders who can help us to empower ourselves in the case of something happen so that we can react quickly. And last but not least, the emotional side. Here, I have paid attention a lot to this. I have seen that in the teams where I work, when we have teams that uh, undergo uh, serious pressure, we start to see a uh, risk as something normal. So, but it's important to take note of the different uh, security incidents to be clear about when things are happen. When we have been undergoing threats for so many years, we realize that we are lowering our guard and that we are maybe putting at risk our colleagues that we have traumas. So in this project, uh, I'm telling you about, we try to devote uh, time and effort for this to develop individual and collective therapies because uh, some investigations were very dangerous and tense. And thanks to these therapies, we avoid fighting among us. And secondly, uh, sometimes we say, okay, we need to stop this because the risk is too high. Or we realize that some members of the team were lying or not investigating enough because they were afraid of continue investigating. So the uh, emotional verification working on these uh, emotional issues on how are we handling our fears? This is very important to protect ourselves and not to uh, lower our guard with regards to the risks. Yes, sometimes we are so burnt as journalists uh, that we lower our guard. Jose Luis, in your case, after this, you have uh, developed several uh, protocols uh, about what to do. I don't want you to uh, disclose uh, secret information, but what could be your um, tips for freelancers that do not have a media outlet backing them? Well, some ideas. The first, and relating this to something said by Marcela when she was uh, saying that sometimes we seem paranoid with these uh, security measures, and somehow, because in the end, uh, our lives are quite normal. There's no special thing. So most of the measures we have applied, we apply them with a lack of certainty about the utility of these uh, measures. Sometimes you feel paranoid and you say, why am I doing this? Am I really closing the door to hackers or spies? One of the things that I think is important to understand is that Security is a process and safety is a process, but we need to assume our responsibility and take the necessary measures to protect ourselves. So this involves a change in our way of doing our work. So if you think that using signal, you're protecting yourself, yeah, it's better to use it than not uh, using it, but you need to understand your job from the perspective of security. And I think that journalism in this regard still has a long way to do in our uh, collective reflection. We need to understand that the journalism involves two factors, industrial security. When we see a person uh, in a construction site without a helmet, we think that person is irresponsible. We need to have that same mentality. We're talking about life at risk 
and the life of our sources at risk, not only ours. And I believe that we need to continue evolving and discussing these issues and doing our best to understand that this is about responsibility and ethical responsibility. In a civic society, you have individual responsibility and collective responsibility. And in this regard, it's better to be paranoid than that being irresponsible. And we need to do a constant job to make sure the measures are taken uh, properly. To understand that security is part of our ethical professional commitment. We cannot be good professionals if we don't do our job in a safe way. And an element, and I speak about my project and the people I work with, me, but I think we sometimes uh, keep thinking about our communications. Pegasus, the malware, not only intervenes to your intervenes your communications. Uh, there is access to your contacts and uh, uh, call logs, so they know who are you talking to, what phone are you calling. So this is not only protecting uh, what you say; it has to do with protecting the sources and your freedom of contacts in your phones. So we need to be aware about our fragility because other, otherwise we're not going to take the necessary measures and be irresponsible. So I think it's important to highlight these two things. These two, two last things. We are lucky that we have received an attack as a team so we can work as a team. But you are speaking about the individuals or freelancers. You cannot protect yourself all alone. Luckily, I think we're living in a time in which uh, from decency, we understand that uh, journalism is a collective effort, a collective process. The, but nothing can be above the security of our colleagues. So those who are outside newsroom uh, in the different countries, in the countries of Central America, I'm familiar with the reality of newsrooms in Central America, all the journalists there are willing to protect their colleagues. But I think this is going to happen in all of our countries. The largest media outlets and the best media outlets are willing to incorporate these security protocols and protect uh, freelancers. I think nobody can protect uh, him or herself all alone. And I'm speaking about this, we're working together, not only from sharing protocols and security measures or putting resources to be shared, but it has also to do with the emotions. The discussions about security are essential. We have been lucky because we have been able to evolve and we were able to uh, bring the problems to the table and discuss them and improve our protocol as a group. And this is quite important for a journalist that he has uh, 12 hours to leave a country. It's so important for that journalist to have someone to call and be sure that someone is waiting for him or for her in the other side of the border. This has a practical application, but it involves complications emotionally. Part of the purpose of attacking journalists is to make us uh, collapse as individuals and as a team. So it's so important. Those journalists that don't have a newsroom uh, behind need to count on someone. There are newsrooms that are willing to assume those freelancers as part of their team, apart from the different solidarity networks that Marcella mentioned. I think it's important to understand that uh, newsrooms are going to give a space to a person that is feeling threatened. I think that those gates are open. And there are also organizations we are sharing with sure. guys. 
that uh, we can go to that we hope are useful. Before we move on to the questions, I would like to know, Christopher, if there is a journalist in your situation, what is the first thing that they need to do? Who should they go to? Are there any organizations? What should they consider when they look for legal help? What should they, what should they look for? Yes. Of course, the levels of safety, in my case, uh, are assumed the level of certainty on what you're publishing, whether it's uh, verifiable uh, to navigate complicated legal situations. Despite that, or in my case, as you can see, uh, this happened. One thing that the book uses a lot and uh, that I use a lot of my, uh, my work on the TV channel is that we back up our information with the access to public information. For this book, for example, I uh, employ about 50 requests of access to public information that uh, can be seen in this book. And this gives you a level of certainty because when you go on trial, it is easier to prove to a judge to be able to say, where does this information, where does this uh, statistical number come from? This is where it comes from, the municipal tea, the, this uh, gentleman was a mayor, gave this to me, or this is the judicial file on this uh, the page, this is a quote. In this case, apparently this has not helped a lot, but it is what you need to do. And this is what I would give as a small suggestion, how to ensure our information to avoid this kind of lawsuits. Now, if we talk about a normal work in the TV channels, such basic things as not talking on the phone about complicated matters that you're uh, investigating, never go outside of our media outlet to talk to our source. We usually try for them to visit us and not go to this kind of meeting or share with our co-workers the location, the phone number, even the license plate of the car uh, that you're going to go get into. There are small things with which we deal day to day. And you have to insist that in Peru, we don't necessarily have this level of violence against the press, at least not physically but uh, the lack of uh, uh, safety comes from the legal side. And in the case of this uh, book, Plato uh, Como if this is concerning, if this sentence uh, sticks, then it's going to be a precedent for any other man in power, for any other politician, when they feel that their interests are in danger, they will look to this precedent to say, okay, there is a judge who opened this investigation uh, based on, uh, uh, people being quoted and that uh, this will start um, uh, this will sound an alarm that uh, there's a sentence uh, on a journalist just because he quoted people uh, despite the high level of uh, fact checking the, uh, that has been published in uh, the website of uh, press and society for example Quoting the stories of violence of the ex-wife of this character, Cesar Cunha, that she suffered in their marriage. She talks about uh, very heart-wrenching episodes of violence that she suffered at the hands of this gentleman when she was his wife. And the sentence, for example, for me, uh, quoting uh, her, uh, it's uh, the, the sentence uh, that imposed upon me is as if I was there. So. What I say is to simply have a level of fact checking that is uh, as uh, thorough as possible to have your information very ordered, have the documents. If later you have to reference this document and uh, if you at some point you said, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't file this document because it's not that necessary, but you need to have all this in order to be able to prove it. This uh, is what my comment would say. There is a question that is kind of related to this. It says, our uh, media outlet is uh, uh, 
being attacked. And in our country, there has been pres uh, harassment presented. And what has been, uh, what what uh, answer has uh, has there been in your countries uh, against judicial harassment? I would say there hasn't been any, right? Not that I know in El Salvador. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. This is a paradoxical conversation, as Christopher has said. It's uh, protecting your journalism. It's a basic step, but it is very effective to reduce risks. And I absolutely share this point of view. Uh, obviously, being a journalist uh, leaves you exposed, but uh, of course, uh, even uh, protecting yourself with facts doesn't change the context. And when our colleagues talk about how to elevate the level of uh, response to judicial harassment, in the case of El Salvador and Central American countries and uh, similar situations, there is a complete decomposition of the institution. It's a, that is very bad in some cases. This makes it so that that uh, guarantees are very, there are very few guarantees and that the right thing to do, that the right thing is uh, very hard to protect. But what I would say is that uh, to affirm what has been said before, this turns into a political problem of the internationalization of the conversation and the uh, international outcry is uh, to make it more and more transparent, to show this on uh, social networks, to have the ability to uh, explain your case, to provide proof. This has to be done even before the threats come. If you have to prove the legitimacy of uh, your lawsuit, then it's very difficult. You have to construct a previous network, a certain uh, logical chain where your work is validated, your standards are known. This is not going to save you trouble, but it will make the response faster, the international cooperation that might or might not be useful in the cases of Nicaragua or Mexico, we see, oh, well, there's a, a big question mark that it's all very relative, but even without uh, the international pressure, it's, it's, it's not a, a solution, but uh, there are paths that we need to continue exploring and that will eventually be important. It's important to know what's happening in Panama, for example, uh, that's the first step for somebody to be able to exercise pressure and change things. In Peru, Christopher, there's nothing like that, right? Look, to go back a little bit to what Jose Luis said, uh, it sounds very basic to have the information at hand, uh, information that you're reporting on, but it's so basic that we have to keep repeating it. I've never been in this illegal situation before, and I've been a journalist, investigative journal for several years. I've never had uh, this trouble with any other politician, uh, even in the media elders where I was before on the news channel, this kind of uh, defamation lawsuit, this kind of uh, persecution on behalf of this, like I've had on behalf of the gentleman, but you have to go back to the basic to have the information. And if you are forced to prove every little thing, then something is not working right. But what I've also understood with this lawsuit is that what he seeks is to make uh, all the work that comes after relative because if at some point I publish about this gentleman again, which I will do because this will absolutely not be a deterrent for me or it will not work as a gag. When I talk about this gentleman again in some uh, uh, in investigative piece of journalism, his uh, followers on Twitter will probably refer to this previous lawsuit and say, okay, this is probably not true because he has already been sued for defamation. So this will make the work relative. Despite all the different work that you've published before on, on powerful politician, whatever you do from that moment forward, and uh, I'm sure that at, in the Court of Appeals, we will reverse this, but if we don't, this will work as a great relative point 
a turning point uh, where people will question whether this true or not. A journalist has uh, been uh, sued. And this might not be true because, okay, he will, what he published might not be true because he was sued for saying something similar. And in terms of networks of solidarity, I am especially grateful to my colleagues in my country because media outlets in different tendencies, uh, different uh, ideas, different ideologies even, joined together unanimously to this cause and did exactly the opposite to what the politician wanted, says Sarakunia. He wanted with this lawsuit, first to prohibit the distribution of this book and second, uh, he wanted for the story of his life to not be known. And he actually did quite the opposite. The book is on its ninth reprint and the media outlets have published entire chapters of this book and they made it available to all the readers, the citizenship. So the effects, what is the opposite to what he wanted to achieve. This uh, sort of uh, uh, syndicate like backup. The fact that they would uh, publish entire fragments, uh, chapters of the book has worked uh, as uh, a response to a character. You are a very powerful character with a lot of money, but there is a response to you from the prince, a united prince to this power. You are, uh, Mr. Magnate, are not facing one journalist. You are fighting journalism itself, not just one person. So it has worked in that sense, in my case. I would like to close with this idea of uh, uh, social networks, of networks, and uh, there's a question related to that, and I think, Marcella, you are the one to answer this. It says, what has to happen for the journalism to join together and live in a better Mexico? I would add, if, if there are journalists who are listening to us in their countries, if they don't have these kind of networks, what can they do? Because what is the first step? Well, one of the things that we have to think about is that we don't have to let a single threat or a single act of aggression slide, because if one of us is being threatened, we're all being threatened. Many times, even if there are competition, even if journalism doesn't represent, we think it doesn't represent us because there's a precedent. The thing is, if we allow for it to happen once, it's going to continue happening against other people. And this is, is becoming more sophisticated. You also have to think in the government be becoming more sophisticated in uh, threatening and harassing the press. The other thing is, uh, well, I would say uh, take to the streets. What do you have to do? Um, do campaigns against impunity. Impunity is an invitation to continue harassing journalists. If we allow it to happen once and we allow for them to go unpunished because of this, then the political cost will be very low. We have to create this political cost that threatening or harassing a journalist is going to have consequences. If the government does not investigate, we must investigate you know, through these networks. We can organize to, for example, publish a report to demand the visit of the Inter-American uh, Commission, uh, the UN, and uh, on the th networks. Well, obviously it's a little harder to work that way, but it is a medium so, through which uh, a single person or a, a single uh, publishing a single media outlet does not have to face the danger alone because we're all in this together. But I think the greatest challenges that we have is to convince the people to not abandon journalism, the critical press, because we, the journalists, are the ones who make it visible. We make the importance of journalism visible, but we need to let the people know that it's not because we are privileged and because we don't want to get killed and we don't want to get threatened by a lot of violence and that many people are being harassed and are having a bad time, but also that uh, silencing a journalist means silencing the cause that this journalist was investigating. It means silencing uh, myself, silencing my rights. 
So that's where we have a lot of work to be done because we can't just talk amongst ourselves. We also have to talk to the citizens and build these support networks that encompass everything and that people know that if one person is being attacked, we're all being attacked. All right. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. In fact, we went over. But before we close, I would like to thank to the Journalism Investigative Network, our public today, and our three presenters, Jose Luis, Christopher, and Marcela. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. It was a pleasure speaking to all three of you. Finally, make sure you follow GIJN in Spanish and Twitter and uh, check the Twitter feed for future events. Thank you very much again and see you soon.